Hello, I'm Bob Denton, and welcome to another conversation. Well, the midterm elections are upon us, and what do Virginians think about some of the issues in our elected officials? We're joining me to explore the state of the Commonwealth is Dr. David Taylor, Director of the Institute for Policy and Opinion Research, an Associate Dean and Professor of Mathematics at Roanoke College, and his colleague, Dr. Brian Parsons, Director of General Education, Associate Professor of Political Science and Analyst also from Roanoke College. So thank you so much for joining the program. Thank you, Bob. Thanks for having us. Well, first, let's start. Just tell me us about the Institute for Policy and Public Opinion Research. What is it? History and mission. So we've been around for about 30-ish years as a polling institution, but really rebranded ourselves back about a decade ago into IPOR, Institute for Policy and Opinion Research. Uh, Dr. Harry Wilson, now Professor Emeritus of Political Science, did a lot of development in the late 20, 2000s, uh, leading into 2010, brought me on board and got some external consultants to really bring us from an organization that did occasional polls, walking around Roanoke City, doing some telephone polls to modern telephone polling equipment, uh, modern methodologies, and some really good things. So we've, we've been around for about 10 years in our current form, 10, 12 years. And it's been a, a journey of interesting changes in politics, uh, the ways that people answer telephones, not answer telephones, <laughs> uh, people doing things on the web and other sorts of varieties. So it's a changing environment. Yes, I, I love polling. I haven't worked in politics and also um, and covering campaigns and what have you. But you know, when, since about, I don't know, uh, 2012 or what have you, it seems like that the industry has been kind of criticized, uh, missing targets and what have you. And of course, in close elections, if you're within the margin, I still pretty doggone good. But it's taken kind of a hit and struggled in recent years, uh, polling as an industry. Yeah, uh, that's very true. Uh, there's probably at least two factors into that. Uh, Brian might have some more comments on that, but uh, one is the more widespread news coverage, the more instant access to information is that you have more people doing more polls and paying more attention. And it's easy for people to see that our poll may have a different result than uh, CNU or other organizations. Everyone's doing polling and many people do it in different ways. Now there's also this, this more recent trend of being able to not connect to people on the telephone. Uh, so political polling historically, and it's worked pretty well up through the mid uh, 2010s or so, is you call a random selection of people, you ask them for their opinions, and you hope that when you call people, you get a representative sample of the state or whatever body you're looking at. So in Virginia, you call random Virginians and you hope that you get you know, roughly the same number of men and women, uh, maybe a few extra women, uh, same thing for demographics, age, those sorts of things. But as cell phones become more prominent, uh, spam filters are out there, potential spam shows up, blocked numbers, it's harder to call a random number and get someone to answer in a way that you get enough young people in your sample. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a, there's a science to polling, there's a science to the mathematics and statistics of how this works, but you, know, you want to get as good data up front as you can and do less of the massaging on the back end. You know, if you know that Virginia has roughly 22% of its, its uh, citizens between 18 and 29, you think the results at the end should have that same percentage, but you don't get that number of people on the phone that young and you tend to get an older group that answer the phone. Uh, so there's some you know, very sound mathematically theoretical ways that you can look at the data at the end and adjust for that, but it doesn't get you the same information as actually talking to someone who's 19 or 21. And Brian, do you, you concur? Yeah, I think the, the, the thing I would add to that is what, what polling has been pretty clear about for several decades is there's been a steady decline in trust in institutions uh, and government, um, and Congress, and you know, the executive, so on and so forth. Um, and so that likely plays a role in the public's reluctance or at least difficulty that for polling organizations to get folks to uh, agree to participate in a survey. Well, I'm going to we get into some of the mechanics, but um, I do know, uh, again, there's a difference between um, kind of public polls that the news may use, plus or minus five, which can be a 10-point swing. But campaigns who spend the money and have the effort, campaign polling is pretty doggone accurate, I find. And, of course, 
I think exit polls up until the last couple or so, uh, that's where you could really get an insight in terms of dynamics of a particular election. And I'm not sure people understand that those polls won't flash. They're not supposed to be predictive. It's a, it's a moment in time, more or less, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, but campaign polls, I've always thought, are pretty, you know, uh, mm -hmm. tend to be tracing. And uh, the size may want to deny what what is being said, sure. but they have a pretty good pretty good idea. In the industry, I hear that, and we'll talk about some of the challenges and what makes a good poll in just a moment. But um, I'm hearing more contemporary of saying that it's that getting back to the trust issue, that it's hard to get Republicans because they want to mess with you. They may not tell the truth. They, <laughs> they hang up on you. That, that. And I also heard that Virginia was one of the top states of hang-ups in terms of, no, it's tough to poll in Virginia. One said, it was, Virginia, oh my goodness, is one of the top five most difficult states. Any reaction to that? <laughs> we could both go. Yes, I, yeah, I've heard you know, very different things. So you, yeah. you talk about Virginia, and it's interesting for several reasons. One is most states have uh, party registration as part of your voter registration. So in Virginia, when you're calling someone, you might have an idea of whether they tend towards a Republican side or a Democratic side. But this is modeled data provided by voter registration lists, those sorts of things. Um, you know, you talk about Virginia, one of the things that's actually coming out more recently at the uh, public opinion research conferences is that at least in 2021 with the governor's race, uh, we, our polls were actually fairly accurate compared to New Jersey, which also had their uh, sort of off-season um, big election for the state. And it, it, it's, it is hard. Uh, the campaigns poll constantly. They're trying to have up to the and they up to the day information, but they have up to the week information. They're modeling consistently, but you have a, a CNN poll or an iPOR poll or something where we do it, you know, once a month or once every two months. Is there's a lot of change. Now, the hardest part is trying to at some point figuring out who's going to vote, and to go to the Republican and being able to talk to them and whether or not they're they're lying to you or not. Uh, the evidence, at least in the uh, conference world, is, is no, they're not lying to you. But the shy Trump voter was a big worry back in 2016 and, and in 2020 to look at is that kind of individual less likely to answer the phone or less likely to participate. So you want to get as much representation as you can, but anything that messes with that the modeling ends up who is going to show up on election day to vote who's going to send in their ballot who's going to do all sorts of these 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 things we want people to do engage with the election process but um who's going to do it you don't know until they actually do it and uh brian your take on on that no i you know uh dave is uh uh, uh polling expert so i will defer to his <laughs> Uh, take on that. Yeah. yeah, you know, over 20 years doing various uh, meeting with civic groups. I love that, and, and and giving talks and different things. The number one question I always get is these doggone polls. You know, they're no good. <laughs> they can't do this or that. And and how can a thousand or two thousand people predict what the entire nation's going to do? And I always have to come back and say, let me just tell you, you set a cake down in front of me. Give me just a slice of that cake. I don't need the whole cake to know what's in the cake. Give me that slice and I can tell you how much flour, how much sugar, how much. I don't have to drink the water of a whole lake. Give me a quart jar and I can analyze what's <laughs> in the. And then it begins to kind of click. So explain a little bit, if you were to create a poll, um, how do you go about it so that people can understand? So, you know, constructing a poll is about trying to ask questions in a way that makes sense to the person who's going to hear that or see that if it's online, but also get at the question or, or, or societal issue you're trying to get information about. You can't make questions too complicated or somebody may lose you somewhere through the middle. Uh, you don't want to give somebody 10 choices at the end because you can't then, you know, if you have 10 different cakes in front of you, if you taste one or two of them, you have some information, but you don't have a lot of information. So yes, no questions are really good if you have a yes, no, or maybe you don't have an opinion. Those are really kind of the strongest questions you can get if you want to try to see if, you know, would you vote for, um, you know, Ralph Northam again or not. Um, it's the same thing as if you have a, a coin and you think it's not a fair coin, how would you figure that out? Well, you'd probably try flipping it a few times. You know, 10 times you'll get an idea of heads are probably more likely. 
If you do it a hundred times, you get a sense of, yeah, heads is coming up, you know, 5% more than it should maybe. If you do it a thousand times, you're getting even more sure. So this is that same idea. You don't need to talk to 8 million people in Virginia to get an idea of where you're at. You can talk to 600 people, 800 people and get fairly accurate. That's the plus or minus margin of error. Uh, that's statistical theory that goes back um, 100, 120 years. But if you, at the end of the day, the, one of these issues with Virginia and some of the states that are on that line of you know, red versus blue is you can say someone's ahead by 1% plus or minus three and it really means we don't know, but the headline is somebody is up 1%. And I think that's a lot where the polls seem wrong, but really aren't. From a ma mathematical standpoint, they're, they're, they're fine. They're, the amount of them that should be right are right. But when you're close to something that really is close to 50-50, it's harder to tell. And Brian, anything going Yeah, I, I, I'd, I'd, I'd agree with Dave there that, um, you know, sometimes the way in which the polls are covered or the way they're used, right, um, may feed into the sort of uh, reluctance to believe polls that you, that you mentioned. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, before we get into some of the politics uh, aspects of it, let's look at some of your recent polling and, and general sentiments. And let's uh, start with the economy. How do Virginians generally feel about the economy? You know, the economy is something we look at on a quarterly basis, and we've got uh, Dr. Cassins at Rona College, who's a professor of economics. She analyzes our data and monitors this with respect to how the nation is doing. Uh, for most of the time we've been doing this over the last decade, Virginians have generally been a little more optimistic or futuristic than the country as a whole. Uh, you know, things in Virginia trended the same way during the pandemic as the nation did. We've mm. seen as rising gas prices earlier this summer uh, caused us to really rethink how we're using our money and where that might go in the future. But uh, this latest August poll showed that things are rising and folks are a little less concerned about the future. And uh, we'll also notice at the same time gas prices have gone down. So there are some clear connections to how Virginians think about you know, whether they feel comfortable buying big things now or in the future, or whether it's a good time to buy things that they, they need versus something that they you know, put on their wish list. Well, you know, and, and, and not to get too much into the weeds, but you see the general, but then when you look at, quote, the cross tabs, right? Yeah. And where you see, are, are there party differences? So for example, I would think, I'm gonna get in trouble for saying this probably, I would think that there would be less optimism about the future among Republicans than Democrats. Were there party differences? Was geography, geographic differences in terms of the Northern Virginia and South Side, Southwest? Were any of those differences significant that you noticed? You know, from the, uh, the, the polling that we've done, one other thing we've done over the last few years is sort of track something we call political anxiety. You know, how do people feel about the state of politics, government, all those big issues? And we asked a question on there, you know, are the best years behind us or the best years ahead? And I think that captures what you're thinking about is how do we feel, you know, Democrats compared to Republicans? And we found when we asked those questions, they are really strongly connected, not to sort of statewide politics, but who holds the White House? And so we saw when we started tracking this back in 2015, 2016, that Democrats were relatively happy and the best years are ahead. Uh, Republicans were less, less happy, if you will. Uh, and then once Trump won, that made a big switch. Um, not much change in 2017, so there wasn't much change as the governor switched in Virginia. 2020, you, know, you see that red line and blue line switch again where Democrats are more of the forward thinking, optimistic, and not much change even with the change in party for the governor's mansion back in 2021. It really seems like things are becoming more of a national state than a um, local or state-based thing. Yeah, um, Brian. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, you know, political science has documented this for a long time that uh, the voters, when they're assessing uh, the state of the economy or the their views on a presidency or on a governor's performance in office, the uh, the party of the voter and the party of the president has a there's a strong relationship there. Um, you know, the other thing I would say, just in thinking about 
how the public assesses uh, the state of the economy, how things are going. You've heard of the pocketbook voter, yes. right? The people that <laughs> kind of assess the state of the world and the economy based on how they're doing individually. And while there's, there's certainly evidence of that, um, public opinion research has also you know, demonstrated that voters also look at the state of the economy as a whole, you know, as a country or in Virginia, and they keep that in mind. So you know, the truth is, is that voters sort of do a little bit of both. Mm. Well, one issue that uh, you looked at that um, some speculate may play an important role in this midterm election is, of course, the Supreme Court ruling related to, to abortion. Um, tell us a little bit about the general views of, uh, of Virginia about uh, that decision you found. You know, it's, a, it's an interesting sort of thing to look at because in, in May when we did our poll, there was the un, well released draft opinion, unreleased isn't true, so uh, released, leaked, whatever you call this, and you get a sense of how our respondents were thinking through that. So back in, let's see, this is where you get to, if you're going to pull up numbers, <laughs> you don't memorize hundreds of numbers at one time. No. Uh, but we had in, where this was pretty early, there we go. You know, in May, you know, there was 32% agreement with the opinion that was pending and 57% disagreement moving forward through August. Now we know what the opinion is. We see the results, 60% Six, uh, disagreement, 35% agreement. Not much change there, uh, but where you see that change is when you look within Democrats and within Republicans. And it's, it's not unexpected that you'd see that Democrats overwhelmingly see this as a, a very bad thing, disagree with the opinion. And Republican sentiment is, is higher in terms of the agree side of things. But what you find in Virginia is, you know, this is not news to anybody, that abortion and reproductive rights are a very complex issue. Um, people put this as, a, are you for or against abortion? When in reality, as you see people talk about the issue, you know, there are very few people who say it should be totally mm. illegal. There are more people who say that it should be a, a woman's right to choose. But there's you know, evidence, polling data, uh, other sorts of data in, collected by the government, all sorts of places that you know, most people fall somewhere in the middle. Um, has the institution of the Supreme Court suffered um, as an uh, opinion of the Supreme Court as a result of this uh, decision yeah. in Virginia? Yeah, yeah, it's a good question. Um, I think the, the long-term answer is it's too early to tell. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, looking at some of the, the um, polling data that the Institute did, certainly there, there appears to be that um, a noticeable increase in the, I guess, unfavorable responses toward the Supreme Court since the decision earlier this summer. Um, you know, whether that, you know, whether that persists over time sort of remains to be seen. I guess what I would what I would say to that is I would urge some caution in in drawing too many firm conclusions about how the public reacted to that. It may be that the public shift in favorability toward the court uh, was in response to the decision itself, in the content of the decision. Um, it may be in the coverage of the decision. You know, so trying to tease out what happened there can sometimes be a little tricky. So our Governor Youngkin is certainly getting a lot of national attention. Um, at, at the time of this particular taping, my goodness, uh, some people are putting his name in the top 10 as it relates to, to his run. But in terms of his approval as, as governor first, um, how's he doing among uh, Virginians at this point? He's doing better. So this is, uh, you know, an effect in Virginia of, you know, governors cannot run for a second consecutive term. So we get someone new-ish in the office every four years. So it takes time for voters to get to know that person. You know, four years ago when R Ralph Northam became governor, uh, at this point, about 25% of our respondents didn't have an opinion about how he was doing, essentially. They didn't know he wasn't in national news or state news. Uh, four years later, uh, Youngkin is much more playing in the news, uh, having prominence, not just at the statewide level, but as you mentioned, at the national level. Uh, so I think Virginians know a little more about him. 
Um, you know, you could say four years ago, Northam's favorability was only about 43% at this time, and Youngkin's right now is hovering at that 50, 51%. But there are also more unfavorable opinions of Youngkin just because more people do have an opinion about him. And I, I think he's doing fine. You know, there's, there's no evidence that says he's you know, an unpopular governor on that route. There's no evidence saying he's you know, the best governor we've ever had. Uh, he's, he's listening to the state. He's doing statewide things. But in asking questions about how Virginians feel about his future, and we sort of found that you know, one interpretation of the data, and Brian may have a different one, is that you know, Virginia Republicans like young kin for Virginia but they don't necessarily want him to go to the national stage right now. You know, focus on Virginia, you're the governor of Virginia. And we asked across the board, you know, should he run for president? And Republicans were, I forget the exact number, but right on that sort of middle line of yes versus no. But when asked, you know, if you were going to the primary and had Donald Trump versus Glenn Youngkin on the ballot, who would you vote for? You know, Trump takes Youngkin three to one. Wow, wow. Anything you'd like to add? To yeah, I mean, just to follow up on, on that point, I, I would say that, um, you know, the, the, the story about Yunkin and favorability with Democrats, Republicans, and the gap there, um, which is pretty substantial, really is, is consistent with this broader story about kind of increasing polarization in, in American politics that, that you know, uh, Democrats and Republicans see the world, their leaders, differently. Um, and so some of that uh, polarization at the national level has trickled down into state and local politics, the way that <laughs> Democrats and Republicans view their city councils, their, their local governments, to their state governments as well. So. And so you also took a look at um, how Biden's doing in Virginia, which of course he uh, easily won in terms of the, of the election. So how is uh, President Biden doing at the time of your poll? Yeah, there's, there's no surprises here. So among Democrats, he's, he's fairly popular, you know, 77 percent favorability rating. Uh, among Republicans, very low, 8 percent favorability rating. Uh, this is not unexpected. Uh, uh, you know, it's, it's sort of interesting when you see these things over time. You watch, you know, what is job approval or favorability for uh, the president, regardless of who's there. You see these big changes happen around. Um, inaugurations or really big announcements, but uh, Biden has sort of gone the same way as most Democrats. There was a low back in sort of the February to May range as we started seeing increased gas, gas prices and other things. But as the economy starts uh, getting a little bit better, you know, his approval goes up a little bit. Well, in a couple of minutes or so, there are a couple other questions I want to get to, but what about you also took a look at Trump? by himself in an isolation. How did uh, the former president do in that particular? Uh, yeah, we, we uh, you know, asking about Trump is something we, we continue to do. It's, it's interesting to see how that change goes over time. Uh, and it hasn't uh, necessarily gone all that well in Virginia. His sort of favorability has gone from, uh, that's when he took office, let's see, February 2020, sort of starting as a baseline, 32% favorable. And that's gone up, it's gone down to a low of 24% in 2001, 2021, up to 37% favorable now. Um, so that it, it sort of tracks with sort of a national figure. We have seen, I think, a general sense of his favorability fall some since he's out of office, even among Republicans, but uh, he's still a very prominent figure. Yeah, and you know, going back to the uh, the point about polarization, what, what's interesting when you when you look at or compare um, President Biden's favorability to former President Trump, the party gap, the difference between how Democrats and Republicans view President Biden, how Democrats and Republicans view former President Trump, the favorability gap for Biden is about 77 percentage points, and favorability gap for Trump is about 66 percentage points. So, there's you know. Uh, two, two more indicators of sort of the state of you know, party polarization in American politics. Right. And you get a sense from just looking at Republicans at this last poll, favorability for Youngkin, 85% among Republicans, favorability for Trump, 77%. Wow. Virginians elect Youngkin better than Trump, that but is. would still vote for him in the primary, Trump. Well, we only have a couple of minutes, and so uh, both of you, if we can, uh, rather quickly, but. 
I'm, I'm setting, opening the paper and there's a poll reported. How should I understand it? How should I read it? What advice would you give people when they see all these polls that will be coming in the next several, right before the election? The first thing I would do is jump to the section where it tells you how they did the poll. Uh, polls should have something about methodology. What did they do? Be good polls have good transparency. You know, look to see where the information come from. Does it seem reasonable to you? Then look into what the plus or minus is. You know, don't read the someone's ahead by two percentage points as they're ahead if the margin of error is bigger than two. Just take a few minutes to digest the numbers and do that yourself rather than letting someone else tell you what it means first. Right. Well, I'm a political scientist at heart. So what I would say <laughs> is look at the poll result, uh, but participate in politics. Don't let it, don't let it discourage you mm -hmm. from getting out. Vote, participate. Um, I think that those are, those are the essential elements of, of democracy. Well, thanks so much for being with me. And that is all the time we have. I want to thank my special guests, Dr. David Taylor and Dr. Brian Parsons of Roanoke College for joining me. And of course, I want to thank you for joining us and hope you'll do so again for the next conversation with Bob Denton.